Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another BitTensor Brief. Today, we're going to cover Yuma Consensus. So something const, otherwise known as Jacob Steves, one of the uh, founders of BitTensor, said recently, um, has been on my mind. So I'm, I'm actually going to start with this little bit. Um, const said that, you know, if you look at Ethereum, it basically took Bitcoin and expanded in the direction of smart contracts. So it added the ability for, um, you know, these smart contracts to be created, which led to DeFi, which led to the ICO phase, right? You could make your own coins. Um, and that was all great, but that's sort of one direction you could go for expansion. Um, but the other direction you could go is to take a look at the compute side of Bitcoin. Uh, and, you know, and, and I include in that uh, the, the way in which Bitcoin rewards are handed out. So the emission schedule um, and make all of that programmable and all of that variable, right? So if you look at Bitcoin, um, the task that is assigned to anyone who wants to earn Bitcoins is to find, you know, to confirm transactions and to find the hash of the previous block and be the first one to do it. And uh, and if you do that, you earn the coins, right? That is the incentive mechanism. Um, this incentive mechanism is built Earth's largest supercomputer. It's 500 times larger than the nearest competitor and created $2.3 trillion worth of value. So incredibly highly successful thing, right? So what BitTensor did is they said, well, that, you know, that incentivization method clearly works very well. What if we generalize that? What if we open that up? So that's what BitTensor did. So, uh, but also the consensus mechanism itself, the task that you're assigned to do, you know, in Bitcoin, it's find the hash of the previous block. In BitTensor, each subnet defines what the task is and what constitutes successful completion, right? So that piece of it is now programmable at the subnet level. That is highly new and highly innovative. And the method by which um, the validators in the network who, uh, who basically are the judges in the contest that the subnet operator has set up, the ones who decide whether the task was done correctly and by whom and to what degree and to what speed they did the task the best, um, those validators then assign, you know, basically the way in which they come to consensus is called Yuma consensus, right? So in, in Bitcoin, there's one sort of consensus. Over here, it's a programmable consensus because the criteria for what uh, constitutes success is programmable by the subnet operator. So the validators get together uh, and electronically vote on who did it the best. So the subnet owners determine the rules for scoring the miners, but the validators are the actual judges, right? So if you, uh, you know, if it's, um, you know, if it's a beauty contest and they're all holding up, you know, you know, uh, numbers or whatever, uh, it's kind of like that, right? So the validators are the judges in the contest and they are the ones who perform the evaluation and score the quality of the miners work. Right. And it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's sort of fuzzy. It's, it's a value between zero and one. So it doesn't have to be zero or one. It can be on a gradient. It can be on a, a sliding scale. Uh, then Yuma consensus is the mechanism which aggregates these scores, you know, so sort of adds, you know, what, what did everybody say? What did all the judges say? What sort of their combined score? And they decide how to allocate the rewards or sorry, Yuma consensus decides it's electronic. It decides how to reward the miners and the validators uh, accordingly, because the validators are also judged. The judges are judged also, and that's very important. So uh, just to give some examples of some tasks that the subnet operators have set up uh, for the miners to perform and the validators to judge, uh, inference requests uh, to the miners for like subnet 64. So basically subnet 64 shoots, if memory serves, um, is providing AI models. And, uh, and so basically the, the test is test the inference. You know, are they, are there, are there AI models there and can I access them? And what is the quality of the inference that they're providing? So another task for subnet 64 shoots, uh, is to check if they have GPU available to rent. So just sort of poke them and be like, Oh, if I want to rent something, is it actually there? Right. So sort of like a pop quiz, right? So, um, see, so th these are just some examples. So again, Yuma consensus is the algorithm which aggregates the scores produced by each of these validators, right? So the, the judges and turns them in the payouts for the miners based on their performance scores. 
So the miners are paid based on how well they did or did not do. Now, remember before when I said that the validators are also judged, right? So there's, there's judging of the judges. So the Yuma consensus algorithm is what judges the judges, right? So um, they pay validators for being in agreement with most of the other validators. And uh, you get punished as a judge if you're outside of the consensus. So validators that sort of diverge from this consensus, um, they make less money. They get less emissions. They are punished. So in addition to that, um, Yuma consensus also rewards discovery. So it's not just um, that you're validating correctly and in consensus with everyone else, but if you are the first to validate correctly, you're faster than everybody else, you complete your test faster than anybody else, um, you are rewarded with, inc you're given increased rewards. So Yuma consensus notices that, oh, this guy over here is judging correctly, but he's also the first one to figure out what everybody's scores should be. And everyone eventually agrees with them. Well, we ought to be rewarding this validator with more emissions. So that's what happens. Yuma consensus is the mechanism that does that. Okay, so there's a couple other dynamics at work here in Yuma consensus. So um, as, as I said, uh, Yuma consensus compares all the validator scores. But what happens if you have, you know, everyone's sort of in a cluster here, but then there's one guy that's like way out here. Like, what, what do we do with that? So, because this guy way out here could sort of pull the average this way, right? If he's really way outside of consensus. So the first thing that Yuma consensus does is it clips the crazy scores, right? It basically says, all right, well, you're really far out of consensus. So we're just going to mathematically, you know, push you down to like here, right? It will still note, we'll still annotate that there's a minority report, if you will, that's, you know, out of consensus with everyone else, but we're not going to allow it to affect the average in the way that it normally would. The second dynamic at work here is that each validator is backed by tau, right? So when, so when I stake my tau to root, or if I stake my tau uh, to a subnet, in both of those instances, I also have to select a validator to, um, to stake with. So I have to pick which validator do I think is the best? Who do I think is the most trustworthy? And the validators that have the most stake assigned to them, you know, kind of the most votes, right? They've got the most assets under management in terms of staking. They are given greater power within Yuma consensus. Yuma consensus looks at them and says, oh, wow, a lot of people are staking with this validator. They must be important. They must be trusted. Therefore, I am going to trust their opinions more than the other validators. So they, their, their vote means more. Their, what they say means more. So Yuma consensus will take them more seriously and apply um, their determinations, their judgments um, with greater weight inside of the system. So what does this mean overall? Well, it means a couple of things. First of all, obviously it keeps the system fair. Um, no single one validator can control the scoring. Um, second thing it does is this really enables decentralization. So the decisions are spread across multiple validators. Um, and it provides security. So because of the way it's set up, it reduces manipulation or bias. So what does that mean? Well, uh, if I'm a validator and I also run a miner, why don't I just pick myself every time, right? Like, why don't I be like, oh, look, I'm a validator. Oh, look, I'm a miner. Oh, you're the best miner. Oh, am I? Wow, I'll get the most rewards. We don't want that. So this system that is set up, Yuma, Yuma Consensus, um, is specifically designed to defeat that dynamic, right? So you can't really cheat given the way that it works. Okay, so how is this different from centralized AI? Well, there's open participation here. So anyone with a GPU can plug in and start earning, right? They can, uh, obviously, they can be a miner, but they can also be a validator. So there's no, you know, there's no gatekeepers. There's no university. There's no company. Uh, anyone, just like Bitcoin, anyone can set up a Bitcoin mining rig and start mining and contribute to the, the network. You can do the same thing in BitTensor. You can do it with validators or you can do it with miners. Second thing that this provides for is permissionless scaling. So as more and more people become interested in BitTensor, uh, more and more people can, can, can join the network and provide more and more power uh, and, and better and better results to the network uh, by validating or by mining. And the, uh, the, the sort of flip side of that is also true. Nobody can shut this off, right? So miners and validators can come and go at will, uh, just like in Bitcoin, 
miners can come and go at will and it doesn't you know affect the network in any way uh it's it still continuously runs and that's one of the reasons why you can't shut down bitcoin BitTensor shares that same characteristic it's unshut downable uh the other thing it does is it provides for incentive alignment which is of course what BitTensor is fantastic at uh, human consensus ensures that good outputs are consistently rewarded so this makes decentralized networks self-optimizing so so validators who misrank or are malicious are economically penalized. And if you look at centralized AI, um, that trusts the internal ethics board. Uh, so, you know, you got to you got to trust Sam Altman or, or Elon Musk. Right. So you have to trust that their values, their sort of spin on the world isn't baked into the uh, the AI or into the results. And finally, nobody can blacklist a participant. So, you know, whether you sh share political, financial, or competitive uh, beliefs or alignments, um, th the network doesn't care. Just like the Bitcoin network, it doesn't care what the political beliefs of the miners are. You know, if you're contributing to the network and you're doing a great job at doing that, you earn emissions. So you are rewarded. So all of this really enables BitTensor to challenge centralized AI, right? You've got this dynamic, which again is very like Bitcoin, which built the world's largest supercomputer, um, where, you know, the centralized AI entities have to raise money, they have to buy GPU, um, they have to hire engineers, they have to have a building, a physical location, right? Um, it, it's got all this overhead to it. It can't move as fast as something that is decentralized and worldwide, right? Anybody anywhere on earth can participate and, you know, talent can be anywhere on earth, right? I don't have to, I don't have to be located where OpenAI has an office, right? I could be in India. I could be anywhere on earth and I can contribute on an equal footing with everyone else. So if you look at, uh, you look at the past TCP IP, the open standard is what, is what won eventually. Uh, Linux is what won in the operating systems world. Um, Bitcoin is in the process of winning in the finance world. I think it will eventually get there. So decentralization and openness eventually defeats anyone who is centralized. And um, the more sort of um, cleverly you design your decentralized architecture and the incentivization structure of it, um, the faster you will achieve victory. Linux didn't have any incentivization other than just people liked it and thought it was cool. Right. So and that, and that in itself can be enough. But over a longer period of time, uh, what this does, what, what BitTensor does through Yuma consensus, through validators and through miners is to create this ferocious competition. And so you have, you know, you, you basically have something that Jason Calcanis has called the age of excellence. This is the highest possible form of that because uh, there's a contest, you know, every block. And, uh, and, and people from all over earth are competing with each other. And if you're not good enough, you get kicked out. Right. So, um, there is no hiring and firing. There's just incentives and who won the contest. Um, so it is the most ferocious competitive environment, um, yet constructed. Um, and it's also the fairest. So it's sort of the, the best of all worlds. So, um, so that's human consensus in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed this bit tensor brief. My name is Mark Jeffrey. We'll see you all next time.